Governor Carney wants a longer introduction. I see. Uh, good morning, and, and I'm David Wessel from the Hutchins Center on Fiscal and Monetary Policy at Brookings. Uh, it's an honor to be here with uh, all four of these uh, illustrious governors in this beautiful building. Um, I was struck that how much, uh, sometimes it's said that nothing ever changes in central banks, but that's clearly not true in communications. An awful lot has ch changed from Montague Norman's uh, assertion, or at least what his biography, bio biographer said, was that his mantra was never explain, never excuse. And there was once a book on the Bank of England in which the job of the press officer was described as keep the bank out of the press and the press out of the bank. Uh, when I began covering the Federal Reserve for the Wall Street Journal in 1987, as Mr. Evans mentioned earlier, it didn't even announce its rate decisions. Uh, when I came to Germany for the Wall Street Journal in 1999, I once told Alan Greenspan that I had just come to an ECB press conference and that uh, the ECB had provided free food for the reporters. And Alan Greenspan's reply was, yes, and which did you find more useful? <laughs> uh, <laughs> um, Alan Greenspan, as was mentioned earlier, joked uh, that, or maybe it wasn't a joke, that, quote, if I seem unduly clear to you, you must have misunderstood what I said. And I must confess that although I always admired Jean-Claude Trichet's linguistic flourishes in English, I wasn't sure I always understood exactly what he was trying to tell me. <laughs> However, one time I was working on a story on ECB communications, and Jean-Claude Trichet was at the Bank of France, and I went there with a colleague to interview him, and we were discussing about central bank communications, and Mr. Trichet said, it's not so hard, and he had this yellow pad. For instance, there were three points I wanted to make in this interview. I've only made two of them, so let me make the third right now. <laughs> <laughs> so a lot has changed. The prevailing academic wisdom has shifted away from the notion that central banks should cultivate mystery and surprise in favor of transparency and predictability. Uh, Michael Woodford wrote in 2005, before the crisis, that not only do expectations matter, but at least under current circumstances, uh, very little else matters. Communication is now seen as an instrument of monetary policy, and I think as central banks have become increasingly independent of elected politicians, communications has become more important as a way of accountability in a democratic society. So uh, as Jean-Claude Trichet reminded us this morning, uh, other central banks have joined the ECB in holding press conferences. The Bank of England, as we'll discuss later, has a very interesting graphic explaining its uh, recent rate hike in words of one syllable. Uh, people who work for the ECB, Michael Steen and others, tweet regularly. Um, Mario Draghi gives speeches in which can be boiled down to bumper stickers. I was kind of disappointed when I came to Frankfurt that I didn't see whatever it takes on the back of all the Audis and BMWs. Um, uh, and I was uh, fascinated to read a recent Reuters stories in which it was reported that uh, AI researchers from Nomura and, and Microsoft have been using software to predict mu future monetary policy from Kuroda-san's facial expressions <laughs> at press conferences. So a lot has changed. I guess that's a favorable sign. He's, he's, he's laughing. <laughs> um, so today, we're, I'm going to take advantage of this extraordinary panel to ask, has central bank communication gone far enough or too far? Has transparency come at the cost of clarity? How do we judge success? Surely it's not only by how the bond market reacts. Uh, and I think most importantly, and I hope we get to it, what role does central bank communication play in reaching beyond the market to the public uh, that both here in Europe and elsewhere has lost some confidence, not only in central banks, but in public institutions as a whole? Um, and we, we have quite a bit of time here, and so I look forward to some questions later. Uh, I'm going to start with some questions for the, each of the panelists, and then we'll have, I hope, a lively discussion. And uh, uh, Governor Draghi is our host. I think it's appropriate to begin with you. And I, I wonder if you could reflect a little on how the communications at the ECB has evolved, and particularly how you see the evolution of forward guidance. Uh, as you know, as everybody knows, you've uh, made a change a few years ago to tell us that key interest rates will remain at their present levels for an extended period of time. 
well past the horizon of net asset purchases, and you've talked about asset purchase continuing until the inflation process is uh, well underway. So it, has this worked? Is this a permanent feature of uh, central bank communications, or was it just an extraordinary moment? Thanks. Um, well, our, our history of a young institution actually shows that, uh, that forward guidance has become a full-fledged monetary policy instrument. We, it's not only evolved, of course, since the times that you just recalled when, uh, when uh, the major monetary policy jurisdiction could change interest rates without saying anything to the market, uh, to uh, a forward guidance about short-term interest rates and the path of the expected path of the economy, to a much, much richer instrument. And um, in, in, along this journey, we moved from communicating our uh, sort of views of the economy and our views of the interest rates to uh, the reaction function, communication and conditionality. And in so doing, obviously, we were also communicating our views of the economy for the months and years to come. Um, the, the history has two, uh, our history has two, um, landmarks. The first is in July 2013, when uh, we tried to um, give guidance as far as uh, interest rates were concerned in order to shield the Eurozone financial markets from uh, what was happening in the United States, namely the um, paper tantrum. And uh, the fear there was uh, that uh, movements in short-term interest rates could actually um, cause movements along the yield curve and uh, make our financial markets condition deteriorate, as, uh, or as we uh, used to say and still say, and cause an unwanted tightening of financial conditions. So we gave and that, the, the, the purpose of that for guidance, which was the first time, was the forward guidance was qualitative, and uh, the purpose of this uh, forward guidance was protective. Uh, was not uh, was not uh, uh, proactive. Was not, uh, and it succeeded. It succeeded contrary, by the way, to everybody's expectations and everybody's assessment at the time. It was said. It, it was said at the time that having such a broad forward guidance not well-specified quantitatively or time-wise uh, would make it ineffective. Uh, I remember I was, I was an exchange about this, actually in New York, where, uh, where I said, well, you know, we are simpler folks. We stay with simple formulas, and it worked. And then there is another date, another landmark, uh, at the, in January 2015, because, well, after that, of course, uh, there were renewed there were renewed weaknesses in the eurozone and deflationary risks started materializing by the end of 2013 beginning of 2014 and and so in january 2015 we we formulated a sort of a much broader and richer forward guidance where we talk about interest rates we also talk about asset purchases and then the horizon over which these purchases would be carried out, and we introduced also timelines for that. And um, in so doing, uh, the, we also kind of uh, formulated a framework where the various parts of this forward guidance, the interest rates on one side and the asset purchase on the other, would interact in a, it's in a sort of in a synergy so that each would uh, actually uh, amplify the effect of the other one. And I think it worked. So all in all, our experience shows that for guidance has now become uh, a full-fledged monetary policy instrument like, uh, like anything else. Oh, by the way, there's also a good reason for this, uh, for this um, renewed importance of forward guidance. And, and that has to do with a zero lower bound. Until we reached that, we had reached that point. The forward guidance was there, certainly, but it was less, less important. So, do you see this as a permanent feature that the ECB will be giving forward guidance, even as you move away from the zero lower bound? 
we, it's, it's hard to say, but I mean, so far the experience has been successful. Uh, the, of course, has to, it has to be linked with credibility, it has to be linked with many other things in order to be successful. But, uh, but why to discard the monetary policy instru instrument which, uh, which has proved to be, to be effective? But isn't there a risk that you will constrain yourself undesirably by making forward guidance that the markets see as, in Charlie Evans' words, Odyssean when you mean it to be Delphic? Well, the risks are always there, but the point, is, the question you're asking is, are you sure you're always able to make an appropriate forward guidance given certain conditions? Well, that, uh, hmm. that certainly the answer to this is, has to do with the ability and the effectiveness of the central banks. Uh, you can make mistakes in changing interest rates when they shouldn't be changed. Or, or not changing them when they should be changed. And the same, the same thing may happen for guidance. It's well, an I think it has to do like also any... with the quality of the listeners as well. Well, that, that we take for granted. <laughs> <laughs> uh, 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 Governor Kuroda, you've had an interesting uh, experiment in Japan as trying to use communications uh, uh, various ways to change inflation expectations and to lift them. Um, I, I, I'm trying to imagine when Jean-Claude Trichet became president of the European Central Bank at the end of the 90s, the notion that the problem would be lifting inflation expectations probably wasn't on his to-do list. How do you judge your success at this? And what's worked and what hasn't? As you know, uh, we introduced uh, so-called uh, QQE, or quantitative and qualitative monetary easing, in April 2013. And that QQE uh, included uh, two elements. One is large-scale JGB purchase program. Uh, the other is a very strong commitment to achieve the 2% price stability target at the earliest possible time. And then uh, actual inflation rate started to accelerate, and by uh, summer of uh, 2014, actual inflation rate reached around 1.5%, and inflation expectations also uh, uh, approached around 1.5%. But then we experienced a uh, huge uh, uh, downturn of uh, oil prices. Oil prices uh, before the summer of 2014 used to be around 110 uh, dollars per barrel, but started to decline quite sharply. In the next uh, one year and a half, uh, oil prices, crude oil prices, declined toward less than 30 dollars per barrel. Huge decline. And since Japan imports practically all oil <coughs> from abroad, actual inflation rate started to decline since uh, summer of 2014. For the time being, despite this uh, uh, significant decline of inflation rate, inflation expectations somehow uh, remained uh, around 1% plus or something. Um, partly because we expanded QQE uh, in uh, uh, autumn 2014. But the oil price decline continued and continued, and the actual inflation rate decelerated, and eventually inflation expectations also declined. And since uh, mid-2015, uh, there's some uh, notion that um, emerging economy, economies may uh, slow down. Not just China, but uh, many emerging economies in the world may slow down. And uh, oil prices continue to uh, decline. And uh, financial markets uh, became somewhat uh, unstable. So, uh, reflecting this uh, situation, uh, in January 2016, we introduced uh, negative interest rate, uh, which was not very popular. 
uh, minus uh, uh, 0.1% on a marginal portion of uh, uh, reserve yeah. deposit at the Bank of Japan, but uh, quite uh, substantial flattening of uh, yield curve uh, resulted. I mean, yield curve uh, used to be like this, and then significant decline of yield curve and also significant flattening of the yield curve. So uh, <clears throat> during summer of 2016, we made so-called comprehensive assessment of QQE, negative interest rate, and so on and so forth, and reached uh, the conclusion that um, we should better switch from the quantitative target of JG purchase toward uh, yield curve control. That is uh, the uh, overnight uh, policy rate at minus 0.1% and 10-year JGB rate around 0%. And then the yield curve could be uh, quite uh, nice uh, <laughs> for the <laughs> economy as well as the uh, financial markets. Uh, then, uh, Inflation ex expectations uh, uh, more or less stopped to decline. And now inflation expectations are slightly picking up. So uh, two things. One, uh, inflation expectations are formed not only by forward-looking way, but also backward-looking way. And in Japan, where people experienced 15-year-long deflation from 1998 through 2013. Uh, inflation expectation formation appears to be largely backward-looking. So uh, forward, forward guidance and strong commitment, yes, did work uh, to some extent. But uh, looking at uh, the oil price shock and, and the resultant uh, inflation expectation decline, we reached the conclusion that uh, inflation expectation formation in Japan uh, is largely uh, backward looking. So at this moment, uh, yes, we continue to uh, make strong commitment uh, to achieve the 2% inflation target or price stability target at the earliest possible time. But at the same time, we continue uh, uh, strong uh, accommodative monetary policy by way of yield curve control so as to uh, uh, make uh, uh, output gap uh, further improved and, uh, and reduce unemployment rate further. By so doing, uh, actual uh, wage increase and actual price increase would be uh, accelerated in coming months and years. And of all the things mm. you've done, mm. what do you think is in, in what, what has been the most successful in yeah. changing mm. public inflation expectations? Mm. What sort of, which of the various communications do you mm. think has had the biggest favorable impact? I think uh, communication uh, <clears throat> is 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 uh, is not a matter of uh, uh, what you say tech technique or some uh, uh, locution or anything. It's a matter of policy itself. And, uh, and uh, from my experience in the last four and a half years, uh, the best uh, communication policy is to uh, explain in uh, straight words the uh, content and intention of your monetary policy, which could be understood not just uh, uh, <coughs> monetary export, experts or economists, but also the general public. I think that is the most important. And it's not, uh, 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 as I said, a uh, matter of technique. It's a matter of straightforward uh, explanation of the content of your policy and intention of your policy. And uh, we have a monetary policy committee 
eight times a year now. And every time uh, after the uh, Monetary Co uh, Policy Committee, I, uh, uh, I, I have a uh, uh, press interview about one hour, explaining the discussions and the result of the decision by the Monetary Policy Committee. Uh, uh, and even from, some time, from time to time, I use a panel showing the <laughs> figures and, uh, and graph and so on. So, so uh, communication policy is, uh, is, in some sense, very uh, delicate, difficult. But on the other hand, it's, it's, it's not uh, theoretically complicated. It's, it should better be straightforward. <laughs> I think mm -hmm. that's that, that, that the best way, I, I think. Uh, Chair Yellen, you've had uh, now four years of experience uh, as uh, the chair of the Fed, but of course many years of monetary policy making before that. Um, it struck me this morning in the discussion, Beatrice made this point, that uh, sometimes it, people act as if the goal of monetary policy uh, statements is to never surprise the markets and one judges success on whether the markets did what you want. And I'm curious how the markets look from your vantage point. Do, do the markets, the traders, the economists, do they understand contingent guidance? Do they want more certainty from you than any human being could possibly provide given the, the unpredictability of the economy? Well, it's a I yes or no question. <laughs> <laughs> I think the answer is yes. <laughs> um, the, the markets, my experience is that market participants are very interested in knowing exactly when, um, what the, they're interested in knowing what the path of policy will be and when changes will be made, uh, either in asset purchases or the policy path. Um, and that's something that um, central banks are loath to provide, um, and that was discussed, uh, the reasons for that in the first panel. Um, the appropriate policy path certainly depends on expectations about what the medium-term outlook is, and I believe every bit of forward guidance, even when it's been calendar-based over the years, the FOMC is use the words, um, we think such and such will be appropriate in light of the outlook for the economy. And for us, um, really almost all guidance should be conditional and related to uh, the, the outlook for the economy. Uh, obviously, there is inherent uncertainty about the outlook for the economy, and so um, the committee's expectations about appropriate policy um, evolve over time in line with the outlook. Um, when that happens, um, my experience is that market participants feel that often that they've been misled, and I can give you examples of that. Um, we first decided to raise the funds rate off the effective lower bound at the end of December of 2015. And at that time, um, our statement provided qualitative guidance that we expected the path of adjustments to be gradual. But I believe starting in 2012, um, the committee began to publish quarterly projections of each of the participants of their economic outlooks and associated path of policy. So market participants looked to our so-called SEP, or <clears throat> Um, summary of economic projections to get a sense of the policy path. Now, um, a look at those charts immediately reveals that there's disagreement. Um, we have more recently highlighted the median as a kind of summary of the projections of the participants. And in December of 2015, when we first raised rates 25 basis points, the median in the SEP suggested that over the next year there would be four rate increases. Now, as we got into the next year, into 2016, um, there were shifts in the outlook, particularly for the global economy. 
some reassessment of the domestic economic outlook. And um, of course, we intended for market participants to understand that for increases during 2016, not only was there not a committee agreement about that, but also that each and every participant's um, expectations or assessments of the appropriate path of policy would be realigned in the light of new information. Now, um, as it turns out, over the course of that year, we ended up raising the Fed funds rate exactly one time, not four times. And I would say that market participants certainly should have understood um, at the end of 2015, or always, that that's a possibility, that these are not Odyssean type of promises, but Delphic type of forward guidance at best. We're always trying to emphasize the economic conditionality of our forthcoming policy decisions. Um, market participants, I think, felt that they, they were disappointed, had been misled. Um, I certainly don't think that that was the case. And again, I think in line with Governor Kuroda's um, comment, we try to not only explain what changed about the economic outlook that justified our single move in, say, 2016, rather than four moves we might have anticipated at the beginning of the year, um, but also the objectives that we're trying to achieve. And for the broader public, as opposed to market participants, I think the most important thing is to know what is it that we're trying to achieve and that we intend to readjust our instruments that, after all, most members of the public are not fixated on what's going to happen at the next meeting or will there be two or four increases, but they do want to know that we're committed to our 2% inflation objective, that we want to achieve our employment mandate, and that we will readjust these instruments as we think necessary in light of those policy goals. That's our commitment. But I do think... Um, that market participants are looking for greater certainty about the policy path than uh, central bankers think it's appropriate to offer most of the time. So do you ever think that uh, providing the markets with the, the so-called dots, the projections of interest rates by the members of the Federal Open Market Committee, with the benefit of hindsight and your experience, was that a good idea? Uh, you, so, now that you're on the way out, you can be <laughs> candid. I want to take advantage of this. I, I suppose it, it has um, costs and benefits. <laughs> and, um, you know, for, for example... Would you care to quantify them? <laughs> well, I'd say the episode that I just described suggests that there is a cost, because to the extent that the public believes that somehow there's a commitment that is embodied in the median that we show of rate forecasts for the year. That's a cost, and it, it is not what we intend. But on the other hand, also on balance, I think there's been a benefit from providing to the public information about the paths of policy that committee members think would be appropriate in light of um, our objectives. And let me give you more concrete illustration of that. I think one of the things that we have realized in recent years is that so-called R-star or the neutral rate of interest is, li is likely quite low now and perhaps will stay low for the indefinite future in part because productivity growth has been slow and we have aging populations around much of the world. We've said in our policy statement, and this has been part of our statement since early 2014, um, foreseeing that we were um, likely to begin raising rates, we wanted the public to understand that we did not anticipate a path, a sharp path of increase in rates. And we used the language that we expected rate increases to be gradual, which was about as far as I think we could go in an actual policy statement. But what on earth did gradual mean? Well, we wanted to communicate more, 
something quantitative about what gradual means. And we also, I think, wanted to communicate that we thought neutral was very low. And one reason um, why the path could be gradual is because getting back to neutral would mean moving to a rate that likely by long historical standards would be judged mm. to be quite low. And that type of information, I think, was clearly communicated in the SEP. And over time, we actually include in the SEP individuals' estimates of the longer run normal or neutral rate of interest. So we're providing information on that. And um, part market participants and the public could see um, over several years that those expectations were shifting down not only among market participants but also within the FOMC and it gave a much clearer sense of what does gradual mean. Thank you. Uh, Governor Carney, thank you for being uh, patient. I, I, it seems to me that the Bank of England has made a number of no one's ever said that to you before? I, I was speaking. No. Uh, I'm learning a lot. I'm learning a lot. Here. Taking notes. Uh, <laughs> the Bank of England has changed quite a bit uh, in recent years, both in the way it communicates with the sophisticated audience, the so-called Super Tuesday, where you put out the statement and the minutes and the inflation report all in the same day uh, to make the job of the press easier. And then, uh, but you've also done, I've been struck by what you've done to reach out to the public. Uh, uh, there's a, when you did your rate decision, there's a fascinating, simple explanation of the rate increase and the reasons on the website. I think it's inflationreport.co.uk that is uh, uh, clearly written for people who don't understand monetary policy. Why did you do what you did? And later this week, you and several other governors are going to Liverpool, and you're going to speak to high school classes and stuff. So I'm kind of interested in how did your thinking about all this evolve, and what are you trying to achieve, and is it working? Well, um, thanks. Uh, first off, uh, Mario, thanks for having us here and uh, commend the ECB for this initiative. Um, I, I was paying attention. I was learning a lot, actually, uh, there. And one of the things I think you heard uh, from my colleagues about to hear from me, and it's in your question, is that in the end, whether it's the ECB, the Fed, the Bank of Japan, uh, the Bank of England, we're speaking to the people we serve first, markets in parallel or a second. I mean, we're always conscious that the messages in some way will land with the public we serve. And we have a responsibility in various ways um, uh, to get those messages across in a consistent way to the different audiences, but in a way that can, are readily understandable. So just briefly in terms of some of the change, changes we've made, the Super Tuesday thing um, was in part because having a, a a decision, the Bank of England didn't used to have a press release, but having a decision without a press release, it was odd. Uh, having that, then having the minutes come out uh, a while later, um, the inflation report in between with a press conference, three events for the same decision, all with their own nuances and twists and turns. Not surprisingly, it's confusing a bit for the markets, but confusing for the public. Uh, and so just collapsing them together and getting rid of uh, following the lead of the ECB and the Bank of Japan, getting rid of some uh, extra meetings, uh, we save 20 official uh, communications a year. Um, you know, I, I, and I'm doing this, with, it's a pre buttle to Hyun Shin's uh, talk of whether central banks uh, talk too much. We're talking less officially. I see. So uh, there's one institution that's getting more productive. Well, there's a few. Yeah, we're trying to get more productive. Central bank. Uh, yeah. So, uh, but it was partly around that. But then when you look at what we put out, uh, a 50-page inflation report, we keep still communicate in 15-page, you know, uh, speeches with lots of charts. Uh, uh, expert audiences um, uh, read them, uh, understand, digest, uh, respond to them. That's true. But that's not the way to communicate with the, uh, with the general public. And it's not a sustainable uh, form of communicating in a world that has had enough of experts, uh, to, use, uh, to use a famous quote in the United Kingdom. Um, so, and it's also not consistent with how people access information. Uh, just looking at the stats, uh, with all due respect to the Financial Times, 300,000 people read the Financial Times. There are 30 million Facebook users in the UK. So just using different channels tells you orders of magnitude of who you can achieve. But you can't package 
it's not about tweeting your own speech uh, out uh, because nobody's going to receive that and read it. So you have to change the content. Uh, and what we have tried to do, and it's a first shot and you know, we'll, we'll have to get better at it, is to layer the content so you have a very simple message that is tweetable and can go out on whatever decision is made. And then what you kindly just referenced, which is to take a 50-page inflation report and reduce it down to uh, a relatively simple narrative with icons, key, uh, key charts that explain why we did uh, what, we, what we did. And, um, and then to use multiple channels in order for that to get out. The other thing we're doing, though, is trying to change. In order to have this cultural change in how we communicate externally, I think we have to do things internally as well that change uh, the way we communicate to each other. So we're collapsing down. We haven't landed on the magic number, uh, I'd say to my colleagues, but we're experimenting with you know, re restricting internal memos to six pages. Uh, we are making sure that uh, charts and graphs that are produced inside the institution can be instantly picked up and sent out, you know, sort of snip and share uh, outside the institution uh, so that the internal communication has the impact uh, that the external communication is, is supposed to have. And so we need that cultural change. And then the other thing that I'll mention is that we're also trying to uh, what well, we are, uh, increase the number of uh, portals into the bank. So uh, like the Fed uh, uh, there, there's and, and the ECB, there's a blog. Uh, we set up something, Andy Haldane's here, he set up something called Bank Underground. We have now over a million hits on Bank Underground. It's just a series of little short economic pieces by staff that reach directly out to the populace. It is not mistaken for the Bank of England policy view. Quite often, uh, the post will be somewhat at odds with uh, where policy is or might be going, but that's OK, um, because it helps with the general general education. Uh, you talked about the schools. We're going to go out over um, uh, you know, a couple hundred schools this year. But it won't just be me and other governors. It'll be. Uh, uh, you know, mid-career staff uh, who get out there and have broader spokespeople. So getting, I, I, the point I want to make is that in order to be as effective as possible on, on, on speaking with the broader public and, and, and actually ultimately getting to a dialogue as opposed to a monologue with them, uh, we need different channels, we need different content, but we need the change within the institution and you only get that if, if you open it up uh, to a broader number of people than just uh, those at the so, top. Uh, so one thing you're saying is that thanks to the technology, you don't need to use intermediaries, whether they're market analysts or the press. You can go directly to the public, and you describe that. But what what are you trying? What's the goal here? How will you decide you succeed? Is it is the Bank of England popular? Is it that they believe your no. inflation target? What's the what well, are you trying to achieve? Well, six pages well, internal memos is already a big that, achievement. That's a fantastic. <laughs> That's fantastic. But what's the median length of memos at the no European idea. Central Bank? No, can, no in the interest of transparency, can we have no, a, like in a the chart? Interest, uh, in the interest uh, Michael Ehrman can make it. <laughs> no, but I mean, the interest in transparency, I suspect it's true for everyone in the front row and certainly on the panel, is you get, you know, 300 pages of briefing a night uh, easily on, uh, right? So, you know, this is a major, this would be no, a major. That, but okay, but, but no, but to go to the, what really matters about um, uh, the public, what are you trying to do? At the top layer, what you want is um, uh, for the institution to be viewed as, as credible or just competent, that price stability, <laughs> no, but this is, this is an important point. People have much more important things to worry about than price and financial stability. Those should be givens. Um, so they should be, and they should be able to test that assumption in ways that are accessible. Uh, they should be given tools if they want to use them to judge that performance. That's, that's the first thing. The second thing, and I think this gets missed um, in some discussions of guidance, people talk about <coughs> forward guidance, is what do businesses and citizens think about the guidance? You know, it's pretty clear what the objective of the Bank of Japan is if you're Japanese, if you're a Japanese citizen. Uh, when we had uh, guidance both post-referendum and um, our initial uh, state contingent guidance around uh, unemployment, it was pretty clear, and we have limited and gradual guidance uh, basically in parallel with the Fed from early 2014. Businesses across the UK understand that. They understood the contingencies. People understand these messages when they're simple and they're out there, and it affects behavior. Um, and that's actually, that, the first one, competence 
you know, being given the benefit of the doubt. That's crucial. You have to have that. Um, but the other ones, at certain times, whatever it takes, um, gets translated to the shop floor. Uh, you know, uh, it's, it's widely understood. And that has an impact on, mm. on, on economic agents. Now, the market, last point, the market will understandably trade in and out and try to predict exactly what happens with the asset purchase program. Will the dots be exactly followed? There's, there's a lot of money in that, and the market will be frustrated or elated depending on where things. But in the end, it's a bit of a rounding error relative. It's more than a bit of a rounding error uh, relative to agents in the economy, households and businesses. So you have to be able to get out to them. Mm. Uh, Governor Draghi, you have a, a particularly difficult situation in Europe, I think, where, um, uh, you know, I read, well, little I can read in German in the German press, uh, it seems to be rather critical of, of, of ECB monetary policy. Really? Uh, of course, in Washington, if the German press is criticizing monetary policy, that's a sign that you're doing the right thing. So, uh, and the, in Italy, there's a lot of criticism of uh, the financial, uh, the regulation of the banks and stuff. So how do you think about reaching beyond the, the markets to the broader European public? And what have you found works? And what is it you just have to accept that uh, this is Europe and everybody will always be pointing fingers at someone else? Well, we, we do a lot, but I wouldn't overdo this. I wouldn't overdo the crisis we get. Uh, they, are, they are there. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the reasons why they are there is that uh, we speak, we use English. And uh, in different countries, especially in some countries, the newspapers, there are some newspapers, for example, that have been shielded from international scrutiny because they've been using their domestic language and they've been sending constantly the same message for years and years and years, no matter what the reality was. And so the readers of this newspaper, if they have no other access to any other source of information, think that the reality is a one color while it's a different color. Do you have anybody in mind in particular? Not really, no. <laughs> no. I'm just... <laughs> Because uh, so, transparency goes only so far, but, right? But that's, yeah. <laughs> so it's, uh, that, that is a fact of nature. There is nothing you can do about that other than continuing to send the message that you think it's right, that reflects reality, to be transparent and, uh, and use these all, all possible channels. It, by the way, it, I sounded as if we were using only English, but in fact, we are using all the official documents and everything else is being translated in 19 different languages. Now, but that's one official communication. It's different, of course, when, when you talk to newspapers or even on, tele on television, you use English. And uh, so um, it's good to reach out. We're trying to do our best. Many things can, be, you know, can improve. Uh, we now have a, a website which has, if I'm not mistaken, something like a million access a month. We have a Twitter account, which is about 400,000 access, uh, and, and so on. We have uh, press uh, conferences, speeches, uh, all sorts of, we're trying to do our best. Any initiative that is being proposed is accepted uh, gladly about that, because, because of what you said, because of the different, the peculiar reality in which we live. So any effort should be, should be undertaken to this extent. But, there also must be, as you said before, there must be ears that are ready to listen. And uh, in if, uh, if you have realities where, where no matter what, the reception is, uh, is not there, uh, it's, it's not a good reason for being discouraged. Actually, it's a good reason to do more and more and more. But uh, the victory may be far ahead. On the other hand, we are comforted by the fact that uh, everybody else listens. So when you look at the uh, whether it, the sort of you ask yourself, well, is this a majority of the people who are criticizing us either for supervision or for uh, for monetary policy reasons? Now the answer is it's a minority. It's a minority which is basically which has shielded itself from international scrutiny all throughout. Uh Chair Yellen, uh, in the, once upon a time in the United States, basically the only person who spoke on policy was the chair. Uh, Paul Volcker and Alan Greenspan kind of laid out the line and other people said they were in favor of whatever it was the chair just said and, and the sun will come up in the morning. But uh, in Ben Bernanke's 
era and yours, there's been a democratization of the process. It's much more open. And, but that means that there's a lot more people talking about monetary policy. And as Christine uh, Greff said this morning, that's part of the game here is to try and figure out how to not increase the noise at the expense of the signal. So how have you found managing the message of the Federal Reserve when we have, when you have an, at full strength a 19-member Federal Open Market Committee with uh, people not all in Washington, some of whom seem to enjoy being quoted in the press? Is that um, uh, annoying, frustrating, a problem? So this really is one of the challenges of our system. We have a very large committee, 19 people. Um, as you mentioned, we've had a kind of democratization of monetary policy that began really under my predecessor. Um, I think our system has great strengths. The most important strength is that we, are, we avoid groupthink, which is um, a real pitfall in policy committees. I think it's important to have people sitting around the table who bring independent-minded views um, to the making of monetary policy. So um, it isn't an autocratic process, and it was, I think, under Chairman Greenspan and earlier a more autocratic process. We have very healthy policy debates, and yet we usually are able to reach a consensus about um, our broad policy strategies and um, most moves that we make um, most of the time. But from a communication standpoint, it is challenging um, because individuals, members of the committee, um, are able and give lots of speeches, um, the press, um, often covers and gives a lot of attention to each individual speech. Um, to try to deal with this, and we probably will never, given our structure and size, be able to deal with this totally effectively. But some years ago, we adopted, the committee adopted a policy on external communications. And we agreed as a committee that what we want to do is explain to the public um, the committee's goals and strategies for achieving them. And we committed that each member of the committee in their public communications, first and foremost, would explain the logic of the committee's decisions, elaborating on what we jointly say in our statement, which is a, um, a joint communique of our assessment of the outlook and likely uh, policy um, strategy or path. Um, now, sometimes that gets lost. Um, individuals should be explaining in their speeches, um, really elaborating on what's in the statement and explaining what we have agreed upon. We agreed that having done that, um, individuals can go out and explain their individual perspectives. Um, I'd say that guidance hasn't been totally faithfully followed, although many of my colleagues do try to do that. And um, the press tends to pick up on differences, um, particularly difficult when we have an upcoming policy decision. Um, generally, our guidance states that people should avoid trying to forecast short-term policy decisions and certainly not make commitments about how they themselves will vote at a meeting that has not yet taken place. Um, that type of statement um, is very negative for collegiality. We um, do believe we should be going into meetings prepared to listen to one another before making a policy decision. But I will admit that um, often uh, at least what's reported is that individuals are talking about having made up their minds about policy communication, about policy for a forthcoming meeting. So this is a work in progress. Um, diversity is a strength of the committee. The whole design of the Federal Reserve System going back 100 years um, with the reserve bank structure we had was intended to bring a variety of perspectives and voices to the table. That works. Um, we try to 
communicate a consensus in our statement. A reason for adopting press conferences is the members of the committee wanted there to be someone, namely the chair, who would be out trying to explain the committee decisions, the consensus, um, leaving them a little freer to voice individual views, but uh, it is challenging. Um, we, we mentioned earlier our summary of economic projections. Um, we have recognized as a committee that uh, we could um, offer the public greater guidance if instead of just displaying um, at full strength 19 different views on the outlook and appropriate policy had a single committee view or possibly um, a, a consensus view. Um, we have experimented with trying to produce a consensus view, and I have to say those experiments um, were not successful. Um, partly we have a very large committee in attempting to um, craft a consensus view of the outlook, including a path of policy, proved to be extremely challenging. Um, we discovered also that when you're operating with multiple instruments of policy, so some of the experiments that we had were taking place just as we launched QE3, and a consensus forecast would have required us not only to agree on the outlook for policy and the future path of policy, but also the path of asset purchases, and that was perhaps reaching too far to think that 19 people could agree on that, but do recognize the fundamental point that's the starting point for your question that um, it is confusing to the public, so many voices, and those are some of the ways we're trying to cope with it. Uh, Governor Kuroda, do you think that, do you ever think that maybe there's too much transparency, that you have a very complicated uh, uh, set of objectives in Japan, you know, there was disagreement where you had a quantity target and a price target at the same time, mm -hmm. negative interest rates, but they only applied to a small uh, fraction of bank reserves. Mm -hmm. Uh, do you sometimes worry that you're overloading the public with information as opposed to clarifying? Uh, yes and no. Uh, <laughs> and of course, the detail of uh, our current uh, policy framework, uh, QQE, with yield curve control is uh, sufficiently complicated. Uh, so uh, it's not... Uh, I mean, we do not expect that the general public would understand each detail of our policy framework. But at the same time, as I said, uh, what is the core of our monetary policy uh, framework and what is the intention of the, the, the policy framework, I think uh, could be explained and, 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 and should be understood by uh, the general public. Now, uh, our monetary policy committee consists of nine members, three from the Bank of Japan, meaning uh, a governor and two deputy governors, and six others are from outside. And uh, every time uh, we discuss uh, economic outlook, financial market situation, and uh, discuss about uh, monetary policy uh, itself. Uh, and uh, always uh, we take vote uh, regarding uh, the <coughs> monetary policy uh, itself. And uh, we disclose uh, in the statement after the monetary policy uh, uh, meeting who uh, were opposed and who uh, agreed to the policy actually adopted by the Monetary Policy Committee. So uh, as far as uh, the, the, the uh, monetary policy itself, content and as well as intention are concerned about, uh, we are totally transparent. Uh, does it uh, create some uncertainty or not? Uh, of course, as uh, Janet said, uh, I mean, like any other central banks in uh, emerging, in developed countries, uh, 
our system is, uh, is, uh, is, is, is like this. I mean, monetary policy uh, decision is made by a body of, of, uh, of, of, of committee, committee consisting of uh, nine members. And, uh, and uh, uh, pres governor uh, cannot uh, decide monetary policy uh, always the majority uh, decide the monetary policy. Mm. And uh, since uh, uh, there are diversity of views among uh, monetary policy committee members, it's quite natural, uh, not always uh, uh, unanimous uh, uh, support is, is made to particular monetary policy decision. Sometimes uh, eight versus one, or sometimes uh, six versus three, and so on and so forth. And, uh, and that uh, showing that uh, I don't think uh, would uh, reduce the effectiveness of the monetary policy. Mm. Because uh, it showed uh, the diversity of views. And after extensive discussions on economic outlook, financial conditions, and they reached uh, by majority the appropriate uh, monetary policy to be implemented See. until the next uh, monetary policy committee meeting. I think this is rather not a weakness, but the strength of, of the monetary policy uh, decision, right. uh, showing well, the, 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 the extensive uh, deliberation. Right. Right. On the economy and 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 and, and policy. So, uh, I don't think uh, current uh, uh, transparency uh, 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 is 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 uh, is uh, making any negative impact on the effectiveness mm. of monetary policy or effectiveness of monetary policy decision. And what this. I think it's 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 basically okay. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I think it reminds me of something that Don Cohn once taught me, that monetary policy is always appropriate at yep. the moment it was made. <laughs> <laughs> Governor Carney, you had an unusual uh, ex communications challenge with the Brexit vote. That's completely unlike what we've been talking about, inflation and unemployment. Right. I mean, I think it must be the definition of an exogenous shock, Brexit. So how, how did you think about communicating, and with the benefit of hindsight, how well do you think the Bank of England did? Uh, thank you, David, um, uh, bringing that up. Um, uh, For the well, record, I warned him I was going to ask. Yeah, he was going to say, you said Brexit, and I said no. I said don't ask him. That was the full dis discussion. Um, a couple of things. One of context, um, as you referenced, we have more than monetary policy responsibilities, uh, price stability responsibilities the Bank of England, also responsible for financial stability, safety, and soundness of banks. And under the statute for financial stability, we are, we are required under law to identify major risks or potential risks to uh, financial stability. So in the run-up to the vote, um, we had to flag that we viewed that under certain scenarios, um, uh, uh, Brexit could uh, involve uh, you know, material financial stability risks. And uh, we particularly had to do that because behind the scenes, uh, we were working with a number of financial institutions and with uh, the other members of this panel um, to uh, take contingency actions, or at least discuss contingency actions, in case certain scenarios might have, um, uh, might have transpired. Um, and so on the morning of the vote, uh, after the vote, rather, um, a vote that at the time, you know, going into the vote, as you recall, it was, the market was betting only about a 10% probability uh, that the vote would go the way it did. Uh, at uh, 10 o'clock the night uh, before the, you know, as the polls closed. Um, so it was a surprise, um, and there's some dislocation in, uh, in, some, or in some of the markets, or there's some actually less dislocation than big moves. Um, and the communication uh, issue we had following the resignation of uh, uh, the Prime Minister, the British Prime Minister, was to just get across a very simple message to first the people of the United Kingdom and, and relatedly uh, markets to say we were well prepared uh, for this situation. And um, you know the line that stuck was just to say that. We are well prepared for this. Um, and then we expanded a bit. Uh, I expanded a bit in terms of what we had done and intangible uh, 
uh, to, for, to be tangible for markets, we had had institutions pre-positioned with us collateral that would have allowed them to draw 250 billion sterling that day if they wanted uh, of liquidity. And of course, and I referenced that we had coordinated with the other major central banks in uh, discussing contingencies. There were no commitments or anything, but there, it, it, there was a sense of being able to address uh, things in foreign currency as well. So that was a, um, a challenge which I think helped just to get across, again, a, a simple message and necessary message that you know, this, this bit of this, you know, the, the system's fine. Um, uh, issues have been anticipated and um, life, can, uh, life can go on. Now, um, the Brexit process, as you know, is, is going on. Um, and so the communication challenges related to it um, uh, continue. Um, and one of the things that we, we've had to try to get across two things, if I may just take a minute Please. on that. Um, the first is that um, these are exceptional circumstances uh, that the UK is operating uh, in at the moment, and that is a defined term in our in our mandate, our so-called remit. Uh, and uh, the reason there are exceptional circumstances is that there is a a, a uh, impact on UK real incomes at least for a period of time, um, and that uh, at, at the point of uh, exiting the European Union, to put it in tangible terms, I think everyone knows, but. If you're going to trade potentially substantially less with your largest trade and investment partner, it takes a while to replace that income and it will have an effect. Um, it has an effect through asset markets who've reacted very quickly, exchange rate, um, also equities. It has an effect a bit on demand, uh, particularly business investment, not surprisingly. Um, but it also has an effect, very importantly, on the supply side of the economy, um, in part because of business investment, in part because of less labor being available, but also because a certain proportion of capital, physical capital, in the economy uh, will become obsolete uh, for a period of time. Um, certain trade avenues will, will, will change. And uh, it's the mixture of that exchange rate demand and supply effects that matter. As we sit today in the, during the negotiation, process, it's the expectations of those effects that matter, how they affect the economy today. And um, so what this translates it from a policy perspective is into two things. Um, the first is that during these exceptional circumstances, we will stretch out the horizon over which we return inflation to target from above. Um, uh, so inflation, uh, 3% uh, at the moment, uh, and how long we take it to get back to target. Normally, you'd say 18 to 24 months. We will stretch that out to three years. We've made that clear. In order to support the economy uh, during the adjustment process. Um, so we're, we have a trade-off uh, that's there. There are limits to the extent to which we're willing to do that, and we reached, uh, as a committee, we reached those limits a few weeks ago, which is why we uh, adjusted interest rates. That's the first thing we try to get across. The second thing, uh, is on Brexit, on the moment of Brexit, it will very much depend on what the final arrangement is with the EU27 and what the transition path is from here to there, um, how those affect demand, uh, probably weigh on demand for a bit, although it depends on where demand is going into it, um, supply, how big the effect will be on supply and what happens on the exchange rate tariffs and inflation. And the balance of those effects, ex ante, it's not clear which direction they go into uh, because you could see a balance which is inflationary and there not being that much spare capacity in the economy because capacity has been taken out. You could also see uh, a, a mix of effects where there is uh, quite a... Um, expansive uh, relationship uh, with Europe, that there's a reasonable transition horizon, not much uh, spare capacity is taken out, um, the exchange rate and other asset prices rally, uh, demand holds up, and, 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 uh, but relative to supply, it's disinflationary. You could, you could paint either picture. Um, and so what we're trying to get across is, is uh, particularly for market participants in the media, the, the, the balance of these um, so that people uh, can adjust as these negotiations proceed. What we, to, and to finish where I started the previous question about, well, but what are we trying to say to the people of the United Kingdom? Well, very simple. Um, we'll do whatever we can to support the economy subject to in returning inflation to that 2% target, so don't worry about inflation. So we'll support, but within limits. And secondly, we will make sure the core of the financial system 
is resilient to whatever outcome. So we're, we're going to ensure that the banks and our stress tests are coming up in a few weeks. And the key judgment, I think, around that that external observers have to make is, are those banks resilient to a uh, worst case outcome? And it's our responsibility to make sure that's the case. So again, the people in the country can worry about, I mean, you know, if you're an exporter, you have things to worry about or, or to, to address, maybe I should say. Um, and uh, and, and uh, obviously citizens do as well. So. Uh, but price stability, financial stability um, will be addressed by the bank. Right, but still challenging to when you ex ante, you don't even know which way. Yeah, and uh, it's, it's, you know, uh, the real reason why you want uh, transition uh, arrangements are for businesses in the real economy on, on both sides and, uh, and for right. the financial sector, not because it makes my life more difficult, obviously, but, uh, ah. uh, but it certainly would help uh, if I can put my vote in for it. Uh, um, a reasonable transition uh, period. I will do so now, just to be clear. I would like, I would like one. Is that in your remit to help that happen? Uh, so it seems to me when the history of central bank communications is written, your whatever it takes and believe me it will be enough will be seen as like one of the prime examples that words really matter uh, and that they can, at the, at the right words at the right moment can have a powerful effect. So I'm curious what you learned from that how much of the reaction, you saw everything coming, you had perfect forward guidance, or do you, uh, were you surprised by how well it worked? And what were you thinking anyways? <laughs> <laughs> well, that's like with Mark, we agreed we wouldn't ask this. But, uh, but uh, <clears throat> kind of no, but that's, that's an example of how guidance, uh, we were not yet in the forward guidance framework, it's an example of how guidance can actually uh, elicit stabilizing behaviors, stabilizing expectations, stabilizing behaviors. And um, the, the message was, uh, in a sense, was twofold at the time. The first was that the central bank would have means to ensure that uh, any uh, redenomination risk, as we called it at uh, that time, uh, namely the euro may well disappear from any time now, was unfounded, ungrounded, unjustified. But the second message was that the, in so doing, the central bank was actually acting within its mandate. And that's the other important point. So, and, and a lot of effort after that, uh, that, uh, those, those words, uh, a lot of effort was, uh, was spent in making sure and convincing people that we are actually acting within our mandate. So that links with transparency discussion we just had. Uh, at that point, probably at that, at that point, like, uh, like never, uh, before and certainly never after that, it was quite clear that uh, the, um, the, bank, the central banks are, uh, are in, that one, when central banks are uh, very powerful, and that was shown by the effect of those words, uh, that were independent, and that was shown by the fact that we were going at that point against some sort of convictions which were strongly held in some parts of the Eurozone, uh, and they were not elected because we could take that decision without going through the debates, parliamentary debates, or anything like, like that. At the same time, exactly because they are powerful, uh, independent, and not elected, we've got to make clear that we were acting within a mandate that had been stated by the legislators which were elected. And, um, and, that's, and in a sense, all the core cases that have followed that, uh, that, uh, that decision were actually helpful, very helpful in clarifying this, this point. Um, and um, so the, the transparency is an integral component of accountability. It's a duty, no question about that. Obvi obviously, transparency is also, and that in a sense been shown by, by that example you quoted, transparency is also to be welcome because it improves dramatically the transmission of monetary policy. At that time, transmission of monetary policy was impaired by the fragmentation that was pervasive in the euro area at that time. You, you remember mm. that. And, and the change in, in, in that situation uh, was the beginning of repairing the euro area fragmentation to the point where we are today, where basically 
uh, lending rates and spreads, especially across different countries and sectors, are at historical low. And also, the other thing that is important to um, appreciate now that uh, a few years have passed since then is that uh, the, we, we, we calculate the dispersion index across countries because probably the most important thing for a monetary union is convergence, convergence of different countries. And, and the dispersion index between the growth in value added in different countries is now at its historical low. You have to go back to 1997, so even before the euro being created, to find such a low dispersion, which shows basically the countries have converged a lot, at least in terms of growth rates, at least in terms of growth rates. So, in in a sense, the the story of that uh, of that um, of that episode shows that um, guidance helps to stabilize behavior. And this stabilization behavior, especially at times of crisis, of course, has a very powerful effect on, uh, on co especially in the monetary union, on convergence of different countries. Mm -hmm. So you had this all worked out when you made that statement? <laughs> no. <laughs> so, no. Uh, but that's a good thing about having people like you ask these kinds of questions. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'll take that as a compliment. Um, uh, so, Chair Yellen, on the other hand, the taper tantrum episode where uh, Ben Bernanke told Congress that you were beginning to think about uh, tapering the QE purchases had an outsized effect on the market, clearly not uh, the one that was intended, something of a surprise to Ben Bernanke as he writes in his book. So what do you, what's your sense of why did that happen and what did you learn from that that you employed when you finally did do the... To the exit from QE and nobody noticed. So we were very surprised by the outsized market reaction to the chairs. I think this was in May of 2013. Um, his indications that um, there were conditions that might be in place that would um, make it appropriate to start um, reducing our, the pace of our asset purchases. Um, the reaction we saw in the market, I think the 10-year yield went up by 100 basis points or maybe even a little bit more. Um, that was something that simply could not be understood in terms of surprises about the path of our balance sheet. And in fact, um, if you look at the dealer surveys that we took around that time um, that the New York Fed routinely does, uh, the things that Chairman Bernanke said were pretty much in line with what market participants indicated they expected at that time. So looking back on that experience, I think what caused the taper tantrum was that uh, the timing of the communications and somehow its character was unexpected and led not only to um, some small shift in expectations about the path of our balance sheet, but um, a significant shift in expectations about the path of the federal funds rate. It was interpreted as an unusual, hockey sort of uh, intervention that surprised the markets and suggested that there would be a steeper path for the federal funds rate than markets had anticipated. So what were the takeaways? I would say two that played a role when we've now made the decision to start shrinking our balance sheet. Um, lesson number one, it's important to prepare the markets um, thoroughly um, for uh, what we intend to do with our balance sheet. So before commencing shrinking our balance sheet in October, we laid the groundwork in a long set of communications in which we provided more and more detailed uh, information about how we would go about doing this. And importantly, we wanted to make completely clear that the process would be one that would be orderly, very gradual, and would avoid market disruption. Second, and I, I think we were successful in doing that, Second is um, we understood that communications about the balance sheet can uh, be interpreted by market participants in the public as entailing information also 
or, or leading to revisions and assessments about <coughs> the policy path. And therefore, we needed to communicate clearly um, what would be the determinants of the policy path and not allow th those assessments to be jolted by an the undesired for short-term short rates right. and not to be jolted in some unintended fashion by our communications about um, our balance sheet. So we made clear early on that what we intended was for the federal funds rate to be the primary policy tool that we would only begin to shrink our balance sheet when we felt we had sufficient scope, when the funds rate had reached a sufficiently high level and the economy was sufficiently robust that we would be able to use our funds rate, at least in most circumstances, as a tool to adjust the appropriate path of policy to achieve our goals. And when we felt we had enough scope to use the funds rate, only then would we essentially put our balance sheet on a path to shrinking, um, essentially as a background thing running on autopilot unless there were a very large negative shock to the economy. And um, we made great efforts to communicate that, that um, there was no change in our objectives, no change in our assessment of the economy, that to the extent that shrinking our balance sheet would tend to gradually raise the term premium and lead to some tightening of financial conditions that in effect, um, the public should ignore that because we would offset on any unintended, there wouldn't be an unintended mm -hmm. shift in the stance of policy. We would take that into account in setting the path for the federal funds rate. And I think we've been successful in making those communications this time. Let me ask one final question before we turn to the audience. Uh, Gabrielle, I want to make sure that I'm confused by the clock. So we have till 11, 20, right, thank you. Um, uh, do any of you find it difficult in the current environment to communicate with people in the financial markets without uh, leading to the press and others saying, oh, you're giving away the secrets to the, to the traders and the, and the moneyed interests rather than the public? Is that a constraint on you or not? Well, I mean, I think we all only communicate with financial markets in the way we communicate with the public now. I mean, that... that no closed-door meetings with, with... Well, if the, we... I mean, people will have meetings from time to time with financial market... I mean, I'll speak for myself. Um, we will have meetings with uh, people in the financial market, as you'd expect. It's not going to surprise you that as a regulator of... You know, right. most large banks. We will meet with the bank CEOs and chairs, for example. Um, but you know, you always have someone there. You uh, and when you meet and discuss the economy, you say what you say. I mean, that's the bad news. You say what you say um, in public uh, previously. I had a slightly odd. I'll, I'll give you one example experience. Um, I went to Chatham House once, and you know, Chatham House rules. Um, and I spoke you know, about uh, the economy and Brexit. Uh, you know, various stuff. I said exactly what I said the day before in public. And someone leaked it to the press. And it was, you know, a quote that was exactly the quote from the previous thing, but it was like, you know, because it was Chatham House rules and they weren't supposed to be leaked. I, that's a bit unfair to poor Chatham House by revealing it, but they did break their own rules. Um, but, and so you have to be, I mean, obviously you just have to be conscious right. of that. And, you know, for financial market participants, you know, the bad news is it's, it's take. Right. You know, we're meeting with them to, uh, to learn about their perspectives on, on what's going on. Yeah. Come further. Uh, you may know that uh, before becoming a governor of the Bank of Japan, I was president of the Asian Development Bank for more than eight years. And the way uh, the committee is managed uh, does have some implications to communication strategy. Uh, LV has uh, 67 member countries including almost all Asian countries, plus US, Canada, and 17 <coughs> European countries. Their interests are so diverse. Uh, and, uh, and yet, uh, almost all decisions by the executive board, board regarding uh, individual 
uh, uh, loan project, uh, policies, long-term strategies, whatever, uh, board decision is made not by voting, but by consensus. And uh, the, the, the decision uh, would be uh, released uh, immediately, uh, <clears throat> showing that uh, this was decided by consensus or something. Now, there are two issues. Always the board insists uh, to take voting. That is staff salary and budget. And here, of course, uh, 12 members of the board representing 67 countries have diverse uh, views regarding staff salary and, and the budget. And uh, requested by the board, uh, I always took uh, voting. And, uh, and, uh, and usually, more than 51% of voting share supported the uh, management proposal. But this is a bit awkward. And uh, the press release would not show any country who supported or uh, opposed or, or how, 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 how many voting shares supported or, or opposed. The, the press release does not say anything about that. Just say that uh, supported a few uh, members of the board objected and so on. So very, very, uh, I don't say ambiguous, but very general. <laughs> right, right. Trying to avoid uh, accentuating uh, the board uh, 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 um, diverse right. uh, views. Uh, on the other hand, the Bank of Japan, as I said, um, always take voting, right. and the voting result is immediately right. uh, released, uh, who opposed, who supported. Uh, why? Probably because um, Monetary Policy Committee is devoted uh, to discuss and decide monetary policy. Right. Right. Fairly narrow range of issues, unlike uh, development, climate change, corruption, whatever issues in Asia and Pacific. That's right. quite complicated and, uh, and the diverse views among shareholders. On the other hand, monetary policy committee decide uh, policies in the next uh, few months. Right. So, so it's, it's quite, quite. Uh, so you're the only person I've ever said yeah. that going from being president of the Asian <laughs> Development Bank <laughs> the head of the Bank of Japan was an easier job. <laughs> um, I'd like to turn to the audience for questions, and we have some mics. Uh, uh, we have a lot of people, so I think you could keep your questions short. And as before, there's a gentleman over there. Identify who you are, and if you want to ask a particular person. I'm going to take two or three questions so we don't end up with the, uh, everybody Central Bank of Lithuania, Gedry Simonavičius. Uh, short questions maybe to all governors. Um, leaks on monetary policy decisions, from your perspective, uh, are they very disruptive or maybe it could be, could be even used as a communication policy, you know, to send signal to check markets? I see. Okay, thank you. And I think there's another one over there in that same, yes. Yeah. I'm going to take a couple. Um. Witold Grosler from the National Bank of Poland. Um, communication has been very effective at anchoring low interest rate expectations, and, and it's, this, this has been very useful, especially at the zero, zero lower bound, and it has, has been quite effective in uh, boosting economic performance and preventing the deflationary risks. But it has probably come at the cost of depressing the interest rate premia. And now, uh, given that the in many asset markets, we've, we've got quite high valuations. Do you think central banks should become more vocal about the risks there might be in the asset markets that might have been a side effect of the ultra-loose po policies and which might have been appropriate from the macroeconomic point of view, but in terms of financial risk-taking perspective, might right. have had some side effects. Thank okay, you. those are two meaty questions. Why don't we start with the first one? 
leaks, however defined, are they disruptive or a good way to prepare the markets for what is going to happen anyways? <laughs> Mark? Well, um, you can't really leak a decision that isn't, hasn't been taken. Um, and when you come together, these committees and um, you know, certainly the Bank of England, I, I think all these cases, uh, the decisions taken in the room and, and, and we've never had a leak. Uh, between taking the decision and releasing the decision, first point, second point quickly, is that we don't uh, prime the press ever. We don't talk to the press. And, I mean, if we have an interview, it goes up publicly. Um, the, the, you know, we say what was in the speeches. We don't, um, uh, we don't brief journalists on uh, stance polls. Uh, similarly, we, um, we consider leaks to be very disruptive. I, I can't really think of occasions when there were actual leaks of policy um, decisions, and it is something that would be very contrary to our um, communications rules and um, would um, re you know, really be a violation of FOMC confidentiality um, restrictions. I mean, we do in our speeches try to prepare the markets um, for policy that we intend to put in effect. And sometimes when policy expectations in the market seem to be out of alignment with our own expectations, um, I, I have done this myself given speeches in which I try to say things that will correct that misalignment, but this is in public settings, and I certainly wouldn't describe a public speech with press um, present as a leak. So that's something that um, hasn't happened and um, is not something that would we would tolerate as policy. But what role do conversations with the press have in your communication strategy, apart from the people covering speeches? Um, you know, I would say also in, in communications with the press, um, I would avoid giving specific indications, again, of policy decisions that actually haven't been made while trying to explain what my views are of the factors that bear on that, bear on that decision. So um, when we make the policy decision, it can be well understood. And of course, I'm also doing that in my public mm -hmm. communications. So, uh, Mr. Draghi, do you want to, do you, there's obviously a risk of when you anchor in, interest rate expectations low, a financial stability risk, a risk that asset prices will rise. And I think that the gentleman from the Polish Central Bank was asking, at times like this, when the economies are strengthening, is, is emphasizing those risks appropriate role for a central banker? Well, this question has been with us since the beginning. Uh, aren't your policies uh, having side effects on the financial stability side, on depriving savers from their uh, rightful interest rate, uh, whatever that is, and, uh, and so on? Um, here, there are different answers. The first one is that uh, uh, we have a mandate. The mandate is price stability, and it's defined as having an inflation rate which is close but below 2%. So we have to deploy the instruments that we consider fit and proper to achieve that mandate. We um, have said we are not here to protect the profitability of the financial system or the banking system or, the, or, or, other, or other objectives that maybe they're worthwhile uh, uh, being, um, being protected, but they're not in, within our mandate. The second point is that um, if the monetary policy is successful, um, we will see an improvement in the macroeconomic conditions, which will be the best tool to fight against financial stability risks. Let me give you an example. <clears throat> Negative interest rates, when, when we started with that, were hard cries of the, especially the banking and insurance sector, pension funds, and so on. Um, now, just focusing on banks, what's happening instead is that profitability of the banking system actually didn't go down, actually it's going up. And it has gone up for a variety of reasons, one of which is that it's true, by the way, not even the net interest margin has gone down because the quality of lending has improved so much and the provisioning against bad loans has gone down, have gone down so much that uh, basically compensated the potential negative effect of, ne of negative interest rates. Of course, these are averages. 
within a ve the very large aggregate of the banking system, you may have realities where the negative interest rate is actually a, a, big, a big negative weight. But all in all, we haven't observed that. Are we observing financial stability risks? Uh, well, we are monitoring constantly, of course, in this period of uh, low interest rates, high ample liquidity for a long time. The, the possibility of financial stability risk is something that needs to be, to, to be constantly monitored. But so far, we are not under, observing. Are there circumstances where you think asset prices are out of line, where you think it's appropriate for the central banker to speak and make that warning? Well, we have to distinguish many different situations. First of all, are asset prices out of line? We observe local realities where asset prices may be out of line and not systemic ones, local cases. Uh, for example, we've issued a warning through the ESRB about, uh, about some real estate markets in some large cities, in some specific countries. Uh, or prime commercial real estate uh, uh, as one of the areas where prices, where valuations are, as we say, stretched or overstretched. Uh, but is it, uh, uh, I mean, is it the change in monetary policy the right instrument to cope no, with I, these yeah. local things? No, the answer is no. That's where macroprudential instruments should be utilized. You? Well, I would agree with Mario's comments. I would say that um, the FOMC does discuss financial stability risks. Um, we indicate what those discussions are in our minutes. And for example, in recent months, we have communicated in the minutes staff's evaluations that asset prices are elevated. That means that price earnings type ratios are at the high end of their historical ranges. But in terms of overall financial stability risks, first of all, um, there's not a judgment involved in that as to whether or not those valuations might be sustainable because um, you know our assessment, it, although there's uncertainty, is that we are in a low interest rate environment and that may be one that's likely to prevail mm -hmm. for a long time. But more broadly, um, financial stability involves looking at leverage, maturity, transformation, the health of the banking system, and taking all of that into account. Um, we've also communicated that our overall assessment of financial stability risks remains quite moderate. Uh, there's a woman here on the aisle. Swaha Patanak from Reuters Breaking Views. Um, I was wondering, uh, both for Mrs. Yellen and for Mr. Carney, Mr. Carney, could you give us perhaps your experience of state dependence guidance, which you mentioned, and given the breakdown in some mm -hmm. of the old relationships, how useful it was to do something that was one step removed, perhaps, from your uh, mandate? And Mrs. Yellen, it, you were talking about how you prepared the ground to avoid a sort of taper tantrum. How does that uh, mesh with the economic sort of um, independence, if you like, independence of, depending on economic data, when you lay the groundwork so clearly, are you trapped into doing something that perhaps economic data might have not justified if you'd had freedom? Right, that's a good question. So if you have state-dependent guidance and the state doesn't, uh, things don't unfold as you expect, causes some problems. Well, not necessarily. Uh, and I, I think it goes back to um, first, who are you speaking to? Um, and, does, and, and can the informed observers um, uh, follow uh, what you're saying? So I'll give two quick examples. First, um, we said that um, we weren't going to think about uh, raising interest rates until unemployment fell below 7%. NBC said that. Um, at the time when the recovery had started and it was picking up quite strongly and on historic, historic reaction function of previous MPCs, albeit, uh, the bank would have raised rates about uh, two to three times, let's, let's, I'll lowball it, say two times over the path from there to 7%. Um, so we provided the guidance of recovery's picking up. We want to make sure that this uh, recovery uh, takes hold. Uh, that's a message first and foremost to individuals and businesses in the United Kingdom. It's also a message to market. The message to market stay contingent. We're not even going to think about it until it gets there, and then we're going to evaluate. When unemployment got to 7%, probability in the market that we were going to raise interest rates in very low. I can't remember exactly, you know, single digit. 
because the market looked and looked at the trade-off and correctly assessed our reaction function and said, okay, they said they weren't going to think about it, got there. They didn't. Now, some you know, commentators would have recharacterized what we said and looked back and said, that doesn't really matter because people understood it and we had polling and businesses understood it and the market reacted accordingly. Quickly, the second example of state contingent, which is a little more complicated, but post-referendum, uh, we eased policy quite substantially and we said in August 2016, the majority of the committee said, if the economy turns out broadly in line with our forecast, we will ease policy further. There'll be uh, uh, further um, stimulus. Uh, and there's a lot of uncertainty, obviously, about the path of the, uh, the economy at that point. The economy picks up. It is stronger than uh, our, our base case forecast. And the market, over the course of that quarter, takes out any expectation of additional policy easing. Again. The time we gave it, um, we provided stimulus because we um, uh, felt it was appropriate to manage that trade-off uh, I spoke about uh, a, while, a while ago. Um, and then secondly, to provide this message uh, clearly uh, that we were going to provide whatever support we could. But the informed observers, the market, um, could understand the state contingent nature of the guidance and took it off when those, con uh, those conditions precedent weren't realized. And so I think in both cases, um, you know, from our perspective, both to general public and to uh, the market, it worked, uh, it worked as it should have. So, Chair Yellen, I think the question was, weren't you boxing yourself in? What if the economy had not performed as you expected? Had you overprepared the market for something? Well, so first of all, we indicated early on that we would on only undertake balance sheet normalization when normalization of the federal funds rate was well underway. So we understood that if we put our balance sheet on a shrinking path by on an autopilot sort of way, that clearly we needed a tool that would have sufficient scope to respond to shifts in the outlook. So we wanted to make sure that in most circumstances, the Fed funds rate and movements in it, adjustments would be um, sufficient to respond to any variation in the outlook that we might experience. So well underway was our mantra for we're not going to start shrinking our balance sheet um, until we feel the Fed funds rate is at a level and the economy is sufficiently robust. We've got a tool to use. But second, recognizing that there could be significant negative shocks that would call into question whether or not we really had enough room um, to lower our federal funds rate. Um, we also put a proviso into our balance sheet guidance. So we said, here's our strategy. Um, this is going to be on autopilot um, and proceed unless there is a significant negative shock that calls into question um, whether or not we might have to cut the federal funds rate, reach the zero lower bound. And in the event of such a shock, we stand ready to um, resume reinvestments or even expand the balance sheet again and resort to further asset purchases if we need to. So we were well aware that um, we needed a policy tool and even a set of policy tools um, to cope with sufficient negative shocks. A gentleman here. Hi, so uh, I'm Stephen Hansen from Oxford, and uh, I'm, I'm interested in this idea of different uh, sort of different target uh, groups. And uh, you can sort of tell from a bond price how a market has reacted to your actions, right? So there are 10-year expectations of inflation or interest rates. But at the same time, several of you have pointed out that you also care about what the public at large thinks. And I was sort of interested in what metrics you, you might imagine you could use to judge whether the public has reacted in the way that you wanted, because uh, that, that seems less clear to me. So it seems clear that it's an important audience less clear that it gives you the instantaneous feedback, or rather any uh, sort of easy to interpret feedback that you can use to sort of, you know, it's judge, like, it's judge like, effectiveness. Likes or dislikes on the Facebook page. Um, <laughs> let me take one, take one more question there, and then we'll let the governor's answer before we break. Oh. 
the management. It's a question probably more for uh, Chair, uh, Chairwoman uh, Janet Yellen. It's about your dual mandate. So how do you communicate uh, when everything, say, well, both the, uh, the arguments of your uh, mandate go in the same direction, probably it's easy to communicate, but how do you communicate when they go maybe in conflicting uh, directions? And so even going through the, your recent experience, uh, uh, if you look at the last year, Indian inflation was somewhat disappointing relative to your uh, uh, target, while unemployment was not. So can we conclude that in the end, uh, the driver of your decision of the last uh, few months was mainly un the, un so the, the labor market side, the employment or the unemployment side of the, your mandate, or, or not anyway? It's a more general Thank question. Thank right. you. So someone besides Chair Yellen want to answer that. How do you judge whether you're successful with the public? Please. Uh, I'll, maybe three. I'll start. Yeah. I mean, look, high level, obviously, uh, one looks at inflation expectations, which are obviously going to be survey based. Um, but there's several layers of, of uh, apart from going around and asking every single person uh, in, the, in, the, in the country, which is difficult to do, you have to rely largely on surveys. There are surveys in relative trust of institutions. There are d surveys of business expectations on the specific, you know, I, my answer to um, uh, the, the woman from uh, uh, Reuters uh, question was based on thousands of business uh, opinions, not just Bank of England surveys, but CBI and other surveys of what business business is expected to happen and what they did because of the guidance uh, issues around Brexit. We have a, a decision maker panel uh, uh, reaching up to um, ultimately will be uh, almost 10,000 businesses across the UK, which you can, you know, which is representative and you and you have to ask the questions. And of course, as you I'm sure you know, um, have you have to have a time series uh, so you can truly uh, judge uh, the relative changes. But if you care about these things, you have to do these, do those in order to help uh, help track anything beyond anecdote. Governor Carter. Yeah. Uh, of course, uh, we uh, continue to monitor the, 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 the bond market uh, simply because uh, bond market is one of the channels through which monetary policy can. Right, but uh, he wants to know uh, how do you measure what the public thinks. Yeah. So that uh, as far as uh, public. Uh, uh, things are concerned, two things. One, of course, uh, various uh, uh, surveys, particularly showing uh, inflation expectations and uh, assessment of the status of the economy and so on and so forth. By the way, uh, regarding, related to the second question, uh, the Bank of Japan law uh, uh, prescribed that the bank must uh, aim at achieving sound economic development through price stability. Right. So yes, price stability is uh, one of the mandate of the Bank of Japan, but it's not simple price stability itself. It's price stability through which uh, 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 Bank of Japan s uh, support uh, sound economic uh, development. So a bit complicated, but I s still think that whenever you assess the public, uh, public uh, 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 evaluation of uh, monetary policy, not just uh, price and price uh, inflation expectation, but uh, their uh, evaluation of the general economic right. Thank culture. you. And, and Chair Yellen, briefly, how do you manage the dual mandate? Is it really dual? So we recognized having two objectives, maximum employment and price stability, they could come into conflict. And when we issued in 2012 our so-called statement of longer run goals and strategies, we were explicit in stating that if they came into conflict, we would pursue a balanced approach, taking deviations of both things into account. And I think many of us were thinking about circumstances where, for example, unemployment is high in excess of the natural rate and inflation's also above target, that we had a commitment to get back to 2%, but we would take unemployment implications into account in deciding how quickly to do that. Now, you asked about the last year, and it's a slightly different situation in which unemployment is lower a little bit lower than levels deemed to be sustainable in the long run, and inflation's also too low. Now, is it really an inherently bad that unemployment is below the natural rate? Um, 
you know, not sure, and I think there are certainly members of our committee who um, would see unemployment going back to the natural rate as a constraint, but not inherently undesirable. So whether or not we're in a conflict situation at this point, namely, um, it's, it's to get inflation back to 2%, we are undershooting um, the natural rate of unemployment that's purposeful. It's an aspect of our strategy. It's intentional. We're doing that to get inflation back up to 2%, which is our commitment. And it is necessary to undershoot the, un the, nor the natural rate of unemployment. But is that inherently bad, a bad thing? I, I'm, I'm not so sure it's inherently a bad thing, but of course we want to get back to 2% and that's our, that's our commitment and the logic of it. So uh, uh, this has been an extraordinary lesson in central bank communications. I want to thank uh, all four of the governors for their time and cooperation and please join me in thanking them as well.